The internet is home to a multitude of communities, people that love games, movie lovers, food critics. Just about any hobby, group, or interest can be found online. There are even groups dedicated to people looking to meet others in the real world. With that much diversity and freedom, it's no surprise that the internet is also the hiding place for the darker aspects of our world. For millennia, people have created stories and legends to explain the world around us, or just to entertain others. One story genre that people love to share is horror. Whether it's the creation of monsters with a moral lesson or just something to scare those listening, there have always been monsters, creatures, boogeymen, to keep us scared. The internet collective is nothing more than people, people who are able to chat, interact with, and share ideas from anywhere in the world. When people get together, they create things. Namely, they create stories and characters. One of those internet creations would step out from the darkness and become a horror that none of us really expected. He was created, shaped, and changed by the internet, and his name is Slender Man. Like with any good myth or legend, there's usually an origin point. While many origins remain unknown or clouded in mystery for many monsters, the Slender Man is not one of them. The origin of the Slender Man has been documented and covered to death, but is still important to the overall mythos of the character. The internet was the creation point for Slender Man, specifically a website called the Something Awful Forums. Something Awful was a website that liked to parody whatever was popular on the internet. They were a satire site that took many different forms over the years. One day, a Paranormal Pictures Photoshop thread was started with the intent of creating fake paranormal images and linking them online. They invited everyone to join in and even gave tips on how to make your images look more realistic. They even had some examples shown as the thread began. Plenty of users were posting all sorts of images with ghosts and other anomalies, but it wasn't until June 10th that something truly haunting would be posted. June 10th had two new images appear on the site. These two images were posted by a user by the handle of Victor Surge. These images were a bit different from the others, as they began to look more realistic and haunting. Not only that, but there was a short description also attached to the photos. The first image shows kids looking unnerved with one really close to the camera. The description under this photo reads, We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. 1983 photographer, unknown, presumed dead. This alone is already painting a pretty grim image of whatever could be happening. The tall man in the background looks almost human, but not quite. The creature's reason for following these kids is also unknown, which draws interest from those that see it. Here's the second image, which shows kids on a playground. They appear to be happy, but what's that behind them? There's something under the tree. That being is surrounded by children. They don't appear to be afraid. The description for this image reads, One of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library Blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished, and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformities cited as filmed effects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986. Photographer Mary Thomas. Missing since June 13, 1986. This second image description is what started to establish the creature's mythos. The video distortions, the missing kids, and the name of the creature, the Slender Man. This is where the entire rabbit hole of Slender truly begins. These weren't the only two photos that Victor Surge, real name Eric Knudsen, would post either. There was this one as well, with an accompanying description. Both subjects were hunting in the Steinman woods four hours before sundown. Surviving subject states that while hunting, both men grew uneasy as fog levels rapidly increased. A constant murmuring sound accompanied by a low hum eventually became apparent to the two men an hour after the fog increased. An object falling out of a tree struck one of the men on the left shoulder, causing him to discharge his weapon. Object said to be the body of a man of unknown age. It was very precisely dissected, with major internal organs still contained within the ribcage in what looked to be clear bags. Surviving subject placed organ bag within backpack. Attack followed several minutes later after a low children's laugh like a giggle. Surviving subject ran until he reached his vehicle. Subject then drove to assumed safety. Backpack destroyed. Surviving subject is classified as a B7 witness. B7 witness to be placed in quarantine. Blind box until resolution. This image is a lot to show what the description says. The Slenderman can be seen using his tendrils to move. The man before him has no notion of the horrors waiting just behind his back. 
As far as Slenderman imagery goes, this is probably my favorite. It really paints the eldritch nature of the entity, the way he towers over the man, but is still humanoid in a way. It all makes him that much more chilling. The next image has Slender in a much easier to see angle, but still makes him appear giant in comparison to us. He lives so easily amongst the trees. It is clearly his home. The description for this image reads, 2007, investigation team discovered 22 bodies of both genders and various ages impaled on broken tree branches in a radiating circle pattern, with chest mutilation as noted with Slenderman. Upon confirmation, lead investigator redacted, called for an immediate evacuation of investigation team at 1700 hours. Bodies first discovered at 1100 hours. Deadline for safe evacuation of team with only viewed physical evidence of Slenderman approximately 1730. Lost contact of team at 1725. Safety procedures fell well within established protocols. Reason for abnormality is unknown. Second team recovered camera equipment one week later. Slenderman safety procedures require this incident's physical photographic evidence to be disposed of by no later than 1020. This description also makes Slenderman feel like an entity that would be at home in the SCP Foundation. He isn't just killing children here either. The earlier posts would make you think that he specifically targets children. That doesn't appear to be the case, not in the earlier lore of the character. These images and story pieces were the original lore of Slenderman. Created by Victor Surge, who at the time had no idea how popular his entity would become. Though, you can see it was definitely primed for mainstream success. The actual idea for the Slenderman was talked about by Nudson during an interview. He was asked what the sources for his inspiration were, and this was his answer. I was mostly influenced by H.P. Lovecraft, Stephen King, specifically his short stories, the surreal imaginings of William S. Burroughs, and a couple of games of the survival horror genre, Silent Hill and Resident Evil. I feel the most direct influences were Zach Parsons' That Insidious Beast, the Stephen King short story The Mist, the Something Awful tale regarding The Rake, reports of so-called shadow people, Mothman, and the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. I use these to formulate something whose motivations can barely be comprehended, and causes general unease and terror in a general population. The reaction was surprisingly good, so I continued making pictures based on Slenderman. He was right about the interest everyone had in the Slenderman. The entire thread slowed posting images and instead started focusing on the Slenderman. There are posters claiming that this thread is now a Slenderman thread. It was clearly the most popular post. There are people creating their own Slender edits as well as adding lore to the creature. Even though Victor Surge created it, it was already starting to seep into the walls of the internet where it would take on a life of its own. The story continued in the thread. Victor Surge posted another image from inside of a house. This image showed a tall man with a tentacle. The description claimed that image distortions seemed to be common with this anomaly, just doubling down on the image video manipulations of the Slenderman. Another post was this doctor's note. The note has ink stains or possibly blood stains all over it. The note is from 93 and has some interesting but crazy text written all over it. The repeated Slenderman phrase along with kill us can be seen in the top right corner. There's a description that's hard to make out, but it looks like it says, Fog rolled in 3 p.m. It appeared, 327. Mark and Evan went outside. Couldn't cover them. Fog too thick. Screams and sounds like a baby laughing, but deeper. It's out in the fog. We may be a little outside of town, but someone will come by. Rest of us can't sleep. No food, no power. What does it want? Tom showed that weird case file. There's a hint of lore here that implies a lot. The most important is that Slenderman has been documented before. The weird case file could also be referring to the earlier fire from the first images, or the children that had gone missing. This is excellent trickling of lore that is being done in just this thread alone. You really feel like the Slenderman is some eldritch entity that has existed and will continue to exist when we're all gone. This actually reminds me a lot of the origins of Zalgo. The original Something Awful creation would become the internet's own eldritch horror. There was a story posted on 4chan that was never properly archived. It told the tale of a group looking into a new cavern with mentions of Zalgo everywhere. The story was well written and definitely HP Lovecraft inspired. Further into the Something Awful thread is another post about a local boy that has gone missing. In Wichita, Kansas, an 8 year old boy named Jake Greenwood went missing from his backyard around 5.20 p.m. on the 19th of May. He was playing near the trees like he usually did, the mother noted. Nothing was out of the ordinary, she continued. It was noted by school officials where he attended that Jake was acting irritable, not only at school, but at home as well. He also made mentions of a thin man in all black. To go along with this report was a newspaper clipping. 
It states that this incident happened in 2004, which means that the Slender Man has been in three separate decades now, the 80s, 90s, and now the 2000s. Along with the article were these pictures that were drawn by Jake. They depict the Slender Man in strange places, but always near the boy. Others were also adding to the lore here with a post from a user named Mr. 47. Police have a few leads in a missing girl case, by Will Higgins, posted June 15, 1987. Sterling City, California. A spokesman for the Sterling City Police Department admitted this week that there were no promising leads in the case of 8-year-old Katrina Elkins, who went missing from her home Thursday night. It's like she disappeared into thin air, said neighbor and family friend Mary Beth Carlisle. Police were called to the residence at 6.30 a.m. on Friday morning by Katrina's father, David. He realized that Katrina was missing when he went into her bedroom to wake her for school and discovered that she was not in her bed. The only possible witness was the victim's sister, 10-year-old Alice, with whom Katrina shares a bedroom. Alice had been unable to provide many details to investigators, however. It seems that the girl suffers from an overactive imagination. SCPD Sergeant William Holmes said, She told us that the last time that she saw her sister was through the window where she was hugging the tall man. According to witness statements, over the past several weeks, a man had been coming to the girl's bedroom window at night, where he would tap on the glass, make faces, and watch the girls. Police investigators initially dismissed the account as a dream as the bedroom window is on the second story with no support beneath it. Alice Elkins reported that on the night of her sister's disappearance, they were again awakened by the tapping on the glass. Sergeant Holm explained, She heard her sister get out of bed and have a short conversation. When she didn't hear her sister get back in bed after several minutes, she got up and went to the window, where she saw her sister in the side yard hugging the tall man. According to the witness, the man looked up at her, grinned, and indicated that she was to come with him as well, with a snaky arm. It was at this point that Miss Elkins became extremely frightened and returned to bed. The tapping continued for some minutes, but finally ceased. Police scoured the Elkins yard for clues with no success. When asked why Alice had not told her parents about the tall man before, she explained, He scared me. He told us not to tell mom and dad, and we'd be in trouble. He told us that he was our friend, and that he would give us anything we wanted. But we had to keep it a secret. His smile was scary, and his voice? He said nice things, but he sounded mean. Police believe that there is no link between the disappearance and the vicious killing of the Elkins cat by disemboweling in April. That now makes two stories about Slenderman kidnapping children one from the originator and another from a member in the now growing community. It was clear that this would become a trend moving forward with the lore. The main difference between this story and the prior is that the girl willingly seemed to go with Slenderman. Jake, on the other hand, seemed terrified that he was being followed by him. The Slenderman wasn't just targeting children though. There's another post about a possible Slenderman encounter. All this talk about a Slenderman from the forest ring a bell was something that happened to me when I was six or so. One fine summer day, my dad said we should go camping. We had never gone camping before. At that moment, my mom got this funny look on her face and said no. We were never going camping, ever. She shook her head and mumbled to my dad, you know why, that skinny thing. That was the end of that. Mind you, this all happened like 15 years ago when I was just a little girl. I really haven't put much thought into it since. But this recent thread reminded me to ask mom about when I saw her yesterday at church. I asked her in the parking lot after mass and she got real quiet, just like when dad mentioned we should go camping all those years ago. Then she spoke. Well, it was over 30 years ago now, and you're an adult, so I suppose it's okay if you knew. I was just a teenager, and Mike was just barely older than I. Him, your aunts, Lori and Kim. Who, I asked? I never heard either of those people before, but she didn't explain and kept talking. We went camping up by Diamond Lake. Those days it wasn't so built up, and it was a nice place to camp. The second night we were there, Lori said she had to pee, so she got up to do her business, a few paces away from the campfire. But she didn't return after a few minutes, and we got worried and went after her. We found her just a few yards from us, staring into the dark tree branches. Kimberly was closest to Lori, and she sort of nudged her, and when she nudged her, she didn't reply. And she didn't reply when she pushed her, and yelled at her, but Lori didn't move. I was just about to ask her what she was doing when I heard this noise calling my name. It wasn't a voice. It was like the sound of nails on a chalkboard. I don't know if it was real or if it was in my own head, but it called me. 
and I was too terrified to move or run or even call out to Mike or my sisters. Then, out of the woods, this tall thing in a business suit came at us. It wasn't walking on its legs, though. It bobbed along on these huge tentacles, like an octopus. If an octopus could walk. I don't remember exactly how many it had, though. It was just lit up by our campfire. I was paralyzed, but Mike wasn't. He started after it and told us to run back to the tent. Suddenly, I snapped back to myself, and I did. I ran back to the tent, and I hid there under all four of our sleeping bags, crying and trying not to listen to the horrible sounds I could hear. No screaming. There was never any human voices. Sounds of crunching and tearing and popping. Two days later, people came looking for us. I was still hiding under the sleeping bags, but they found Mike first, then what was left of our sisters, high up in the trees, skewered like cis kebabs. Whatever it was, it wasn't just content to kill our sisters. Instead, it left Mike alive, with the eyes of both of our sisters in his mouth. They blamed him, and he's been in prison ever since, but I don't think he knows or even cares where he is. That skinny thing took his mind. They listened to my story and said we were on LSD. My family, they knew Mike, could never do anything like that, and they believed me. Weird things happen. Weird things. It's all a bit out there, but it has a lot in common with some of the other Slender Man stories, so I thought I'd post it. This happened in eastern Washington in 1977, and my uncle is in prison, but I thought, up until yesterday at least, that he killed a guy in a fight. I'd never heard of my aunts before though, and I'm not getting any Google results for Lori or Kimberly Ward. But that might be because no one's bothered to put that stuff on the internet yet. This wasn't just adding to the lore. This was a claim sighting of the Slender Man back in the 70s. He was already starting to grow outside of his original story. The internet was starting to do what it does best. That is, take something and start to morph it into its own. You can see this with a post later on in the thread. Someone posted a psych hospital report about a girl in her 20s that was found wandering the streets. She was badly cut and bruised. The initial thought was that she was attacked by someone, but she wouldn't respond to any questions. Eventually, the patient started to speak. Well, it was more rambling. Most of it was incoherent. There were a few choice words that she would repeat, though. Ones that seemed important to staff. She would repeatedly mention a tall man and empty eyes. There was a small breakthrough where she finally said two words in a coherent manner. The words were, You're next, which she said while pointing at the doctor. A few days later, the patient somehow escaped. How she did so is still unknown. She was taken to her room and cameras show that she never left through the front door. All of the windows remain locked and untouched. It is unknown how she escaped and where she is now. Slenderman's lore is starting to develop here. He tortured this woman into near insanity. Then, when she passed on her curse, he took her. There's no word that the staff have any clue what is happening either. The case passed along but never seemed to be followed up on. The earliest depiction of the Slender Man in this thread placed the creature in World War II Germany. He was spotted in a forest where a bunch of undercover soldiers were trying to get some Nazi plans from another undercover agent. This is when they heard a Nazi soldier screaming and running through the woods. The soldier had a broken leg and ran to the group of men shouting that he was coming. They of course had no idea what he was referring to, but it didn't take long for them to figure out who he was. A tall man in a black suit walked out of the complete darkness of the forest. He had no face, but a thin slice where a mouth might be. The person telling this story was the grandpa of the poster. He said that he started to ask the man who he was in every language that he knew. The tall, slender man didn't respond, and said moved closer to the group. Eventually, one of grandpa's men points his gun and tells the man to put his hands up. The slender man then rises from the ground on his tendrils. He wasn't a man at all, but some sort of abomination. He reached one tendril out and grabbed the man before being shot by the group. The bulls did nothing and the monster disappeared back into the forest, with the screaming of the Nazi soldier fading into the woods. More and more Slender Man stories were being posted. People then started to say that they dreamt of Slender Man. He was starting to escape the world in which he was being created. He was already having an effect on those in the thread. All these posts were from 2009, before the golden era of creepypastas. The Slender Man wasn't necessarily a creepypasta. He was an urban legend created by the internet, which is what a lot of the early creepypastas were before they got absorbed into the umbrella term. This isn't to say that the Slender Man wouldn't receive his own creepypasta, but we'll get to those in a bit. The Slender Man was already showing potential as an internet meme. The earliest site other than the something awful to adopt the Slender Man was 4chan. The Paranormal Board made mention of the Slender Man in the same year that it appeared in that prior forum, with the earliest mention being in June of 2009. Stories of the Slender Man on 4chan are hard to find due to how the site operates. It was a pretty popular topic at one point. It was so popular that it started to leak out again from both 4chan and the Something Awful forums. 
There are posts about the Slender Man on sites like the Unfiction Forums, Fangoria, Wikibin, TV Tropes, DeviantArt, and of course Reddit. It even had its own site at one point, Slender Nation. The Unfiction Forums are a place where people post their unfiction stories in one place. Unfiction is a term for stories or artistic works that represent themselves as pertaining to the real world, but are their own contained world. ARGs are another form of unfiction, except that they require players to work. Many stories of the Slender Man were posted to the Unfiction Forums, where they were presented as findings people made when researching the Slender Man. Many of the early works of those that participated in the building of Slender lore presented their stories this way. Like we saw in Something Awful forum threads, people were all sharing stories that they obtained from somewhere else. Hardly any of them were presented as first-hand accounts. This really built the mythos of Slender as an urban legend or myth that was being spread, like the stories of vampires or wendigos. Slender Nation is a forum site that is still active today. It archives thousands of Slender stories and submissions. The most recent posts were from June of 2023. They are doing their best to keep the Slender legend alive. The spread of Slender Man wasn't slow by any means. He was starting to appear everywhere online, but it would be with his appearance on YouTube that things would start to change for the entity. There's a little web series that would take Slender to the next level. It was the start of a trend of Slender-based ARGs. That series was Marble Hornets. Marble Hornets was a web series created in the same time frame as the original Slender Man post, on the Something Awful forums. The creator of the series, Troy Wagner, wanted to use the character in video format since no one else in the post had attempted to do so yet. This led to this post as the preliminary start of the video series. About two or three years ago, a film school friend of mine, Alex, was working on his first feature-length movie. It was called Marble Hornets, and I think it was about a 20-something returning to his childhood home and recalling events that happened there. It was pretty pretentious film student fair, but I helped out for a few days before my summer classes started, and a few rare occasions after that. Everyone on the set seemed pretty excited to be making it, especially Alex. The set itself was about half a mile away from Alex's house, roughly a 30 minute drive away from where I lived at the time. It was a pretty heavily wooded area, I guess to give it a sparsely populated small town feel. Most of the movie took place outside. After about two months of off and on shooting, Alex dropped his pet project completely. It was really sudden when he let me know about it. When I asked him why, he told me it was because of the unworkable conditions of where he had to pick to shoot. Which struck me as very odd since he had been living around that area since he was eight. And never seemed to have a problem with it. What's even stranger is that he acted incredibly distant when telling me this news. Soon after, he started avoiding me, and from what I hear, everyone else. All he did was sit around his house. Being a film student as well, I had to see his work go to waste and decided to talk to him about it a bit more. A few weeks after he had stopped shooting, I finally convinced him to let me come over. Something about him was worse than I'd originally thought. He had lost a good bit of weight and looked pretty sickly. I pretended like I didn't notice and we just hung out for a while. Right before I left, I asked him about Marble Hornets and what he was planning on doing with all his tapes of raw footage. With almost no hesitation, he simply said, burn them. This serves as the introduction into the world of Marble Hornets. Not only is this the start, but it was also posted to gauge interest in the project, though it was likely already a plan in the minds of the Marble Hornets crew. As two days later, the first video on the Marble Hornets YouTube channel would be posted. The video was titled Introduction and says everything that was already said in that original post. The same day, the channel would also release Entry 1. This entry is only 47 seconds long and contains no audio. Here it is in full. As you can see, we are already getting a glimpse of the Slender Man. Well, he's actually called the Operator here. He's supposed to be his own thing, but he's definitely just the Slender Man. Regardless of his name, he still has the look and aura of the creation from something awful. The story begins to unfold as we meet some of the characters, Jay, Alex, Tim, and Brian. Jay is the one presenting the story to us. He is the man posting the tapes. 
and he is also a character that is interacting with the story. He also runs the Marble Hornets Twitter account that was part of the story. I mentioned before this is one of the major Slenderman ARGs. Well, this is actually the most famous of the multiple we'll be discussing in this video. Though, there is an argument to be made about whether this is an ARG or an unfiction story, an argument that I won't be going into here. With the premise of Jay releasing tapes for us to watch and this mysterious man in a suit stalking Alex, we begin the series. Jay is releasing each video on the Marble Hornets channel, with the title of the entry followed by a number. By entry 3, we've already seen that the operator is stalking the crew in the background. He is being talked about in entry 2, and by entry 3, it's pretty obvious that the suited man is stalking Alex and it's having an adverse effect on him. The next time he shows up on tape is in entry 4, where he can be seen moving quickly out of frame. The way the video is recorded was very important for the tone and believability of the era. There were a lot of low resolution and pixelated videos in the early internet horror era. Something about the low resolution just made it more authentic. It really created this world that you were free to interact with and follow. It's a part of the series that I think has kept it the most rewatchable. Along with the Twitter account and the YouTube channel, there was also another channel involved with the story. This channel was named To The Ark. They were another person or multiple people that would post video responses to Jay's uploads on the main channel. This is where a lot of the codes in the series as well as the more cryptic storytelling would be posted. With all this together, it becomes the ARG unfiction piece that we all know and love. This was one of the earliest, if not the earliest, online creation to use this format. There were plenty of others who tried to use these elements for their storytelling, but it was mostly done in order to bring attention to or coincide with their more conventional media. This is one of the earliest stories to go entirely by the rules of the ARG unfiction to tell its complete story. This means that the entire story could be viewed through all of the mediums made available. The Marble Hornets channel, the To The Ark channel, and Jay's Twitter account. This type of storytelling is the perfect medium for Slender, as people were already writing stories this way on the forum. What I mean by this is that the story of Slender was coming out through secondhand accounts by others. Someone was always trying to piece the story together through journal entries or eyewitness accounts. It was a mystery to be solved, one that everyone reading was now a part of. I won't be going through the entirety of Marble Hornet's story, and instead looking at how it shaped the lore of the developing entity of Slenderman. Early on in the series, we see that the video with the Slenderman is distorted in some way, either with some sort of pixelation, audio glitches, or just straight up losing all visuals. This aspect of Slenderman's lore was already developing in the forums, but took on a whole new aspect here. He was actively making it hard for those that tried to capture footage of him. This aspect gets pushed further and becomes one of his trademarks in the future. Slenderman is also shown to have the ability to teleport people. As can be seen when Jay goes looking around Brian's old house, he gets teleported to an abandoned building where he is attacked by him. Tim also gets teleported to a strange void world where the operator seems to be keeping Alex as victims. This follows the lore as early on it was stated that Slender would teleport you to a world that was nothing but the dark shadowy forest, where he would stalk you forever. Also yeah, Alex killed the guy. There's also something called Operator Sickness, Slender Sickness, that is shown to affect the characters of the series. They can be seen going through coughing fits and acting ill when the Operator is near. This also leads to the memory issues that play an important part in the series. It's also a big motivation for a few of the characters, who are suffering from the sickness the most. The sickness even led to two of the more popular characters in the Slender mythos, those being Masky and Hoodie. Both names are community made and not the actual names of the characters. These two would become minor characters in the overall Slender lore, but are part of a bigger discussion on proxies, which we'll get to later. Probably the most notable lore development from the Marble Hornet series, though, were these drawings. These drawings are associated so much with Slenderman that it is impossible to separate the two. It would even become the main premise of the slender indie horror game Rise in the early 2010s, another topic that we'll hit on later. The drawings were part of the lore that really brought out the fear factor in the series. Slender drives those he stalks mad, mad enough to create these images. This series was the biggest push for Slenderman lore into the mainstream internet. Not only did it actually establish a canon for Slenderman lore, it also showed how it can be taken forward, letting others know what they could do with the character. Also showing that you can add to the lore of Slender yourself, like you were an SCP creation. This wouldn't always be a great strength of the lore though. Following in the wake created by Marble Hornets were other ARGs that wanted to use the character and lore. The first worth mentioning is Everyman Hybrid. 
This series was born from a much easier to palette idea than the first. It was a group of guys that wanted to create a YouTube fitness channel. During this, they also used an actor to pretend to be Slenderman and appear in the background of their videos. This was done to drum up interest for their show. The problem is, this somehow summons the real Slenderman to them, who begins stalking and following the characters. The use of Slenderman here is very similar to how it was used in Marble Hornets. He appears in the background as a stalker. His motivations are unclear. It's also very clear that he has some sort of effect on those that he is around, such as deteriorating health, coughing, and migraines. This series is also the first that I could find that introduces proxies. Proxies are essentially people or creatures that are under the direct influence of Slenderman. They may appear as worshippers or just someone who can sow distrust and destruction for the Slenderman. Proxies will be a big topic later, but that's the gist of it. In Everman Hybrid, they appear like zombies to do the Slenderman's bidding. This series introduces multiple antagonists, Slender, Habit, and another popular internet urban legend, The Rake. The Rake starts appearing in the show pretty early on and is interwoven into the lore of the Slenderman here. The two will have some more lore connections later, but this series is the one that establishes that tie. Everman Hybrid didn't change the lore too much as far as Slenderman goes. It even has a callback to a lesser known part of the lore. In one of the episodes, the crew finds these garbage bags hanging from trees. When Evan cuts one open, we see blood come flowing out. This is just an old part of the Slender mythos, back on the Something Awful forums. Slender would kill his victims by impaling them on trees, and later organs could be found in bags hanging from those same trees. This was a piece of lore that not many used going forward, most likely because it seemed more gruesome than scary, like Slender was harvesting organs. Though, I do really like the imagery of Slenderman impaling people on trees. It would be a very unique aspect of his lore. There was another series that wanted to capitalize on the growing interest in the Slender mythos. That series was called Tribe 12. Tribe 12 is the story of a man named Noah, who was dealing with the death of his cousin. He took his own life, and wondering if there were any signs that he missed, he looks through the final tape they recorded while together. In those tapes is where we see the style of the series is very much in line with the other two I've already discussed. Entry 2 is the point where the story really begins. Here you can see strange carvings that should be very familiar at this point. We also get our first look at the Slender Man, the real cause of Noah's cousin's death. This series was the one that really pushed the Proxies' side of the Slender lore. Proxies played a big part in the story. The main antagonist, besides Slender who is called the Administrator here, is a proxy named the Observer. He controls a group of proxies called the Collective. Though the proxies are created from Slender Man, they seem to follow the Observer more. The proxies were pushed heavily with this series, but they'd also had some interesting callbacks that have become staples of Slender lore. The German name, Der Grossmann, was used in the original Something Awful thread with a story about him existing in German wood carvings before the original 1980s photograph. In the series, it is referenced by the German grandfather that tried to shoot him during World War II, which he fought on the side of the Americans. These three series are commonly referred to as the Big Three when it comes to the Slenderverse. The Slenderverse is the name for a group of ARGs all focused around the Slenderman that share the same world. In fact, it goes a little further than that. There have been crossovers between these series, with everyone playing their characters from their respective ARGs. The other series featured in the Slenderverse are Dark Harvest, ML Anderson, Whispered Faith, and many, many more. There's a whole wiki page dedicated to these web series. The list is incredibly long, but the one that I remember enjoying a lot was One Bad Dream, which also featured Zalgo, one of my all-time favorite internet entities. The Slenderverse seeks to expand the original mythos laid out by Victor Surge, the Thread, and Marble Hornets, as well as to share lore and timelines between the other series. One of the most interesting parts to me about the Slenderverse is the continual use of Alabama as the place Slender was first seen. This is due to where Marble Hornets set their series. Also, the entirety of Marble Hornets is canon in the Slenderverse, but as an ARG or web series, it never actually happened. There are tons of pieces of lore created by these web series, some that are still being developed today though most of them wouldn't have a huge impact on the internet's already developing mythos of the Slenderman. Slenderman's popularity was already growing faster thanks to Marble Hornets and the other ARGs, but there was still more to his growth. This is when the creepypasta scene comes into play. You see, Slenderman may be the most popular creepypasta character of all time, but he wasn't originally created to be a creepypasta. His origins, as we discussed, started in a forum. Even without the intent, when a creepy character or story was introduced online this way, they would become a creepypasta. It was the catch-all term for internet urban legends, after all. The first, or at least earliest that I could find, creepypasta for the Slender Man was Tall, Thin, and Faceless, written by Globalis. The story was written in 2010 and submitted to a Writers Guild wiki that distributed it in issue 3 of their monthly series. The story was written around the same time frame as the other popular Slender media. 
The story is a man who has an experience with the Slender Man while on a trip with his wife. The start of the story is a man explaining that all he sees are white walls, as he has been established as being certifiably insane. This man is the narrator, but remains unnamed throughout the story. The story starts with the narrator telling us that he lives a pretty average life in America. He continues by saying that he and his wife always wanted to go to the British Isles. After a few months of saving, they finally decided to take that vacation. They dropped their kids off with their parents and took off. The trip was everything they imagined it would be. Beautiful cities teeming with things to do. After the cities were explored, the pair decided to check out the countryside, which is where the narrator finds a local tailor shop, one that made suits. The tailor claimed to have been making his suits for 61 years, which was enough for the narrator to splurge on one. As the pair were leaving, an image on the wall caught the narrator's eye. In a tall grassy knoll stood a tall man in a suit. The image was kind of blurry though, or appeared so, since he couldn't make out the man's face. The vibe from the man in the photo could only be described as menacing. When he asked the tailor about the photo, he refused to talk about it. Days later, the narrator and his wife were on their plane ride home. The flight felt so far away as they retired from their vacation. They felt ready to sink back into their old life, ready to see their kids again. When arriving home, the narrator pulled into the driveway and took it all in. Something didn't feel right. There was a presence in the air, something that he couldn't fathom. It just felt oppressive. As he got out of the car, his legs buckled and he fell to the concrete below. He must be more tired than he thought. This thought passed as his wife helped him to bed. He was ready for some sleep. He was so tired after all. That night, the narrator had the most vivid dreams he's ever had. Every single dream, in between his waking moments, was filled with that tall, suited man on the grassy knoll. In every single dream, he couldn't make out his face. No matter how close he got, it was always blank and always blurry. The Slender Man, as he called him, was always hiding just out of sight behind trees. As he awoke that morning, he wasn't so happy that he'd moved somewhere near such a dense forest. It felt as if the Slender Man could be hiding just behind the curtain of trees near his backyard. The children would be back from their grandparents today. Luckily, that was able to take his mind off of the tall man. Seeing his kids again was a calming experience. They spent the day with them. More than once, though, the narrator stared out at the trees, half expecting to see him. That night, after they put their kids to bed, the pair decided to watch a movie on the couch. They were dozing off. Clearly, it was time for bed. Then the sound of shattering glass woke them from their near sleep. It came from upstairs. The narrator raced up the stairs and checked on their youngest. He said it came from his brother's room. They ran there next, and there he stood. Standing above the terrified form of their eldest son was the Slender Man. His hands were outstretched towards the boy. The narrator ran to help his son, but was picked up by the Slender Man's tendrils. The last thing he remembered was being thrown into a nearby wall. After that, he blacked out. When he came to, his son was gone, and both his wife and youngest were crying. That night, they called the police. That started their search for the boy. The cops took their statements and started their search of the nearby area. The man helped and was the first to see something in the woods. Attached to a tree was a piece of the suit that he'd bought while abroad. The police asked to see the rest of his suit and he complied. He took them inside and opened the closet. That's when they found the deceased body of his eldest son. He was covered in blood and wrapped in the suit that his father had bought. The man was taken in by police as the only suspect in the case. It was clear that he wasn't going to be able to prove them who had actually done it. They would never believe it to be the Slender Man. Later, the man and his family were placed in a nearby hotel with a constant police presence. They were told to stay there while the investigation was underway. The next morning, a knock on the door awoke the man from his sleep. It was 5 a.m. and he was not ready for the day yet. A police officer, the same from the prior night, came to the door. The man told him that his son was missing. The body of his son had gone missing from the morgue. The narrator knew where the body must be. It must be in the woods near his house. Somehow he was able to convince the cop to take him back to his home, and the two drove back to his house. While inside, the narrator snuck out the back and headed for the forest. In the forest is where he found it. Attached to a tree was a child's drawing, and it was a slender man and his entire family. This was similar to the prior drawing he'd found by his eldest son. The police officer found him and told him they had to go back to the hotel. While walking towards the police car, the narrator picked up a stone and smashed it into the officer's head. The cop stumbled before collapsing. The narrator grabbed the keys and stole the car. He drove back to the hotel in a hurry, but when he opened the door, it was too late. The Slender Man stood in a circle, created from the bodies of his loved ones. The faceless entity stared at him, inviting him. Sirens blared from behind the narrator and pulled him out of his trance. 
he turned to see police with guns aimed at him. When he turned back to see the Slender Man, he was gone. All that was left were the bodies of his family and his old suit in the center. This was the first creepypasta that used the Slender Man, at least that I could find. There were more though, including the blank face, the tall man, and the Slender Man cometh. All of these stories came after this first story and have their own takes on the Slender Man mythos. There are more creepypastas that utilize the Slender Man, but we'll come back to those at a different time. Because there's another event in 2012 that would take the Slender Man to a complete internet meme. That was with the release of an indie game by the name of Slender, The Eight Pages. July 2nd of 2012, there was a game by Parsec Productions that was released on the internet. The game was free and titled Slender. This was the first real game to use the internet urban legend as its main antagonist. Well, not quite the first, but the first one that really went viral. This game was the final catalyst that made the Slender Man into a full-blown meme, and a household name. But before we get to that, let's look at the game itself. The game is still available to this day, but is now titled Slender The Eight Pages. When you open the game, you are treated to the visuals of scratch lettering. The title of the game is at the top, Slender The Eight Pages. You have several options including starting the game, Slender Man Mythos, Options, Extra, Credits, and Quit. The sounds of the game are pretty strong here with music that fits the title and a whistling sound that tops it. The Slenderman Mythos tab is a newer feature that wasn't present in the original game, if I remember correctly, which I probably don't. This tab has two separate options for you to click, Slender YouTube series and other vlogs, blogs, and info. Under the Slenderman YouTube series tab, you can see most of the stories I'd mentioned before. We have Marble Hornets, Everman Hybrid, Tribe 12, Dark Harvest, Anderson Journals, and Caught Not Sleeping. The latter two I hadn't really mentioned before. In the other tab, we have SlendermanMythos.com and the Unfiction Forums. I haven't mentioned the Slenderman Mythos website before, and that's because it's dead. The website no longer works. The Unfiction Forums are still around though. Clicking Start Game, you'll be brought to a black screen with the sounds of footsteps in the background. This is followed by the sounds of a chain link fence and someone jumping over it. The game then starts with the click of the flashlight. After the Slender title goes by, of course. Immediately you're presented with just enough information to start the game. You have jumped a fence into a wooded area. You have a flashlight, and it is very dark and foggy. Your only option appears to be moving forward. The sound design in this game is the best aspect of it. The sound of your feet, the whistling of the wind, the crunching of leaves. These set the tension so well, and far better than other games that I can name. It goes a long way to make you feel alone, and is even better with headphones for the directional audio. The game's graphics are pretty minimal by today's standards, but they looked pretty good in 2012. The trees lack a bit of detail, but as they are mostly covered by the fog, it's not that big of a deal. The flashlight is pretty bright and gives you enough vision of the world placed before you. The game gives you your one and only objective. Collect all eight pages. Scattered around the map are locations from Marble Hornets and other Slender Man series, including the Red Tower and Tunnel. These locations are important places from the Marble Hornets series. In fact, a lot of inspiration for this game was clearly taken from Marble Hornets. At each of the locations is a chance of finding one of the eight pages. These are the eight pages, and do they look familiar? They are the crazy scrawlings of Alex from Marble Hornets. These drawings, or drawing similar, would become a big part of Slender Man's lore. What started in Marble Hornets became a big lore piece that would carry into every subsequent Slender game. The pages say things like, don't look or it takes you, which is exactly what happens. Slender Man will chase you as you try and find all of these pages. If he catches you, the game ends with a jump scare. The idea is to keep moving and never let him catch up to you. Looking at him will also lead to him taking you. The more of these pages you find, the more aggressive he becomes. In fact, the sound design in this section needs to be mentioned again. Originally, just the sounds of the forest can be heard, along with your footsteps. But as soon as you find your first page, the droning sounds begin. Once you get your third page, that's when the music kicks in. This solidifies that growing tension that this game does so well. No longer are you alone, now you are being stalked. And every second that he gets closer, your flashlight gets dimmer. When the Slender Man is near, your screen will go blurry with static. This effect was taken from the many ARGs and shows that you are actually holding a camera. If you press E or Q, you can actually zoom out the screen with the camera sound. Slender Man will eventually catch you if you stay on the map too long. Unless you find the eight pages, that is. The Slender Man model isn't scary, especially since it doesn't even have a moving animation or anything, but the total package of the sounds, visuals, and building anticipation make it still one of the best arcadey horror games that you can play. To say this game was popular upon release would be an understatement. 
The game was released and two days later, the website's servers went down due to the traffic. It was a viral game like no other. The game was popular, but what was more popular was the rising trend in 2012. Let's Play YouTubers were just starting to become the mainstream video format. With this game, so many careers were started. Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, and PewDiePie were all channels that engaged with Slender games. While they had some decent viewership before Slender, the game propelled all three of them into the top of YouTube's recommendation page. Of the three, PewDiePie was the first to play it on July 1st of 2012. He did a face cam reaction, or overreaction some would call it, instantly becoming a classic video in the YouTube sphere. He died almost instantly upon loading into the game. This reaction to scary moments in games became a popular trend in Slender games. Every Let's Play channel was trying their hand at the overreaction to the jump scare. Some actually pulled it off in a comedic way, while others hammed it up a bit too much. Either way, this was the rise of the Slenderman mythos, and the Slenderman fan games. There were a few Slender games that hit the internet around this time, each trying to get a piece of that Slender clout. To name a few, there was Slender Sanatorium, Slender Elementary, Haunt the Real Slender Game, and Slender the Nine Pages. All of these used the same formula of dropping you in a location and having you find a certain number of a certain thing. This was the formula that would take over the whole genre, and kind of made it stale over time. I won't be looking through these games individually, but if you want me to, I could cover them all in a video. Even with all of these games, there was really only one true sequel to the 8 pages. A game that was literally the sequel to the 8 pages, Slender the Arrival. Slender the Arrival released on March 26th of 2013. It would be released on Steam in October with a brand new ending and extended prologue. The game had Eric Knudsen as a producer, the man who created Slenderman. It also had Parsec Productions as developers along with Blue Isle Studios. The game is a girl named Lauren showing up at her friend Kate's house, but finding that she is missing. The game already looks leagues better than the 8 pages, with a lot better graphic fidelity and a better Slenderman model. The sounds and audio design is on par with that original game as well. Lauren starts to search Kate's house as the sun goes down. She finds a flashlight and makes her way into her friend's room. The walls are covered in carvings and drawings. They are pointing towards a radio tower as the only way to safety. There's something else though. Drawings of a tall dark figure are everywhere. It's the Slenderman. With a scream from the woods, Lauren is off on a search for her friend. Slender the Arrival is a more polished version of the 8 pages. When it comes down to it, all they added to the game was more things to do or interact with, such as these generators. More or less, it is following the same footsteps as a lot of the other Slender games did. There's also a story here that feels well told enough. The most interesting part of the game though is the new enemy type that chases Lauren. Slender is a proxy known as the Chaser, who can be stunned with the flashlight. The Chaser adds a new layer of horror to the game, but doesn't really change it all that much. The game was well received upon release. It had a larger number of players than was expected, most likely due to all the horror content creators that played it, with each of their individual audiences adding to the popularity of the game. With all of that, I think we need to take stock of everything that combined to push Slender into the mainstream. The original lore and art from Something Awful that started the whole thing. The Marble Hornets and other ARGs that pushed it to a wider audience. The games that both created larger YouTubers and pushed the game out to more people. All of this came together to make Slender the most popular creepypasta character of all time. When something becomes mainstream popular is when some of the fun of the creation can be lost. With Slenderman becoming a meme in the early 2010s, the original horror of the character was starting to lose steam. This was mostly thanks to the fanbase that took Slender and turned him into a sort of parody edgy anime boy. The same fate that awaited Jeff the Killer. This more or less started with the release of a creepypasta that focused on one of Slender's proxies, Tiki Toby. Tiki Toby was a story about a misunderstood teenage boy that was going through a rough time. A car crash had killed his sister and seriously hurt him. The story follows Toby as he tries to go back to a normal life while being stalked by the Slender Man. He sees him one night and it causes him to start hearing a voice, a voice that he would later follow to kill his dad. Honestly, the story is fine. It sets up a really sad backstory for the character and makes the dad feel like he deserved to be murdered. Toby also can't feel pain which really doesn't come into the story at all. The way everything is described feels more like a fan fiction than a creepypasta though. Regardless of the writing and weird character descriptions, this story would be mega popular. It would play heavily into Slender Mansion, which is a fandom created home for Slenderman. In it, he lives with all the popular creepypasta characters such as Jeff, Jane, Smile Dog, Ben, his proxies which include Tiki Toby, Maskey, and Hoodie. This whole genre shift here was part of the decline of Slender, but it wasn't the only one. Slenderman was used as a meme more directly. He was used in a meme format known as Demotivators. 
where he would be paired with top text, bottom text memes. He appeared in a bunch of music video parodies, including Slender Man, parodying Size Gentleman. With his popularity being at the peak in 2013, he also appeared in several Harlem Shake videos. Not only was this all taking the edge off of the original Eldritch Being, but he was also getting strange lore and side characters added. Splendor Man, Trender Man, and Offender Man were all variations of Slender, and they were all his brothers. I don't want to go into each of them individually, but you get the idea that this oversaturation and watering down of the character was slowly draining his fear factor. This would be the slow and gradual decline of the Slender Man mythos. The pop culture ruining of his character was continuing at almost every corner of the internet. YouTube, meme websites, social media, and fanfiction websites. Though none of that would tank the popularity of the character more than the tragedy that happened in 2014. In 2014, two 12-year-old girls from Wisconsin stabbed their friend in the woods to offer her to the Slender Man as a sacrifice. Their goal was to become his proxies. The girl lived and was able to get police to track down her two attackers. Both of them would be caught by police hours later. They were trying to escape to Nicolette National Forest to be with the Slender Man. They believed his home was hidden in those woods. Both girls would be found not guilty by mental disease or defect. They both received heavy sentences of 25 and 40 years. They would be under constant watch at mental health institutions for those minimum sentences. Though one of the girls would be released early with heavy stipulations and monitoring. This was a tragedy that befell a small town, but also brought scrutiny on the character of Slenderman and creepypastas as a whole. Parent advocate groups were trying to take down creepypastas as they believed them to be the root of this new evil. While this debate from state officials and ex-members of the FBI was happening, the creepypasta community was banding together to raise money for the girl that was in the hospital. Narrators, authors, and the community at large showed their support. This was seen as the start of the gradual decline of the internet's obsession with creepypastas. Views were down, the amount of stories were down, and there just seemed to be a scrutinizing eye on everyone in the community. Slenderman seemed to be going out of style, but it got worse. There were companies that were making Slenderman movies that wouldn't be released until after the stabbing happened, making it hard for them to be seen as anything more than a cash grab and a bit distasteful. When talking about the Slenderman movies, it's important to look at the number of movies there actually are. On IMDb, there are over 30 movies listed as Slenderman movies. There's a Slender from 2016, Flay from 2019, The Slenderman from 2017, always watching a Marble Hornets story, and the official Slenderman movie from Sony. For the sake of brevity, I won't be discussing all of these other films. I'll just be talking about Always Watching and Slenderman from Sony. Starting with Always Watching, a Marble Hornets story. I was told by many in the community that this movie was not really worth watching. It had bad acting and barely connected to the Marble Hornets series at all. In my due diligence, though, I decided that I'd have to at least see the film if I was going to make a decision about it. Weirdly enough, though, I kind of liked the movie. The whole movie is shot in the found footage style that was reminiscent of the Blair Witch or the Marble Hornets web series. The three characters, Milo, Sarah, and Charlie, all have their encounters with the operator, who appears to be stalking them after they discover some old tapes. The movie's plot isn't too bad, a little hammy from time to time though. The look of the operator isn't bad and the way he appears in the background of certain shots is on par with the web series. There's even a few shots I think work better than the web series, but those are few and far between. The main character, Milo, is a cameraman for his local news station. His coworker is an on-screen reporter who he has a crush on. Her name is Sarah. The final character is Charlie, who works at the news station too, but I'm not entirely sure what he does. The characters aren't that important, really. The plot really starts when the group stumbles upon some tapes while doing a story on foreclosed homes. They find that the family that lived there disappeared without a trace, leaving almost everything behind, including the tapes. Milo and Sarah start watching the tapes and find there's a tall man in a suit suspiciously hiding in the background. The more they look into it, the more they start to see him moving towards the camera. The tape ends with them leaving their house one night, when they discover they all have the mark of the Slender Man on them. The mark is the first and almost only connection to Marble Hornets. The symbol of the circle with an X through it has become something very familiar in the Slender Man community. This symbol can also be seen on the walls of a few of the camera shots, along with drawings of the Slender Man himself. Of course, once you start investigating the Slender Man, he starts to investigate back. He starts to stalk the three, and even leaves his own mark on them while they're sleeping. This mark is something that was only in the movies and something I honestly like. There's also an addition that the entity can only be seen on camera, which I also don't hate as a concept. Even if these two additions were interesting concepts, they would never make it into the online mythos of the character. There's a few more scenes in the movie that I believe aren't half bad, but overall the ending was kind of abrupt and uninteresting. 
It's a fun horror movie to watch with friends, but don't go in expecting the level of storytelling that we got with Marble Hornets. It's just a fine slender movie. The movie wasn't well received at all. It got pretty negative reviews across the board, mostly from fans of the original web series. The movie was also seen as slightly distasteful due to only releasing a year after the stabbing. Regardless, it was just another nail in the coffin of Slender. Now, let's talk about the 2018 Slenderman movie from Sony. I actually went and saw this one in theaters, being a massive creepypasta and Slenderman fan since the beginning. The movie rights were purchased by Sony and this is what we got. It's a movie that I've seen only twice, once in theaters and once again for this video. I just solidify a few opinions I had on it before actually putting them into words. The movie is about a group of girls that accidentally summon the Slender Man to stalk them. It all starts in a town in Massachusetts. Why is it always the East Coast? The girls are at a slumber party talking about all sorts of things until they decide to watch some creepy video online. The video is supposed to summon the Slender Man, a character the boys at their school were discussing earlier that day. They don't believe it will do anything and watch it anyways. The following week, one of the girls goes missing while on a field trip to a cemetery next to a forest. She sees a tall visage among the trees. This is the first sight of Slender Man, and I actually like this scene a lot. It really invokes the feeling I had looking at those first few edits from Something Awful. Plus, there's almost always something creepy about seeing something that can blend into the trees. The characters are all eventually taken by the entity, as the only way to stop him is to offer yourself up to him. The ending leaves a lot to be desired, and aside from a few shots, was a rather mediocre film. I remember enjoying the film the first time I saw it, as I was really into the slender mythos and seeing what could be done with the character. Too bad the directors and writers didn't care nearly as much. They took a creative character and boiled them down to a normal horror movie villain. The most interesting concept to come from this movie for me though, was the way he was summoned. The creepy online video that summoned him was the closest aspect to an interesting new piece of mythos that we've gotten in years. It should have been more of a factor in the film, and the use of cameras in general was completely lacking here as well. Though the film did incorporate a slender sickness in a way, but it just wasn't close enough to the original lore. The film was panned by critics and casual audiences alike. It also didn't really do well in theaters domestically or abroad. It was called in bad taste by the father of the girl who survived the slender stabbing, and he urged theaters not to show it. Overall, it was seen as a cash grab that didn't live up to the name of the original entity. The movie wasn't bad enough to be so bad it's good, it was just boring and predictable. These movies would bring the Slender Mythos to its lowest point. With all this bad press, the community was seen as a joke for even liking the character. What started as a concept for a Lovecraftian creature that drove those around it to insanity, a being that no one knew what it was capable of, was now turned into a B-horror movie monster with no personality. The creepypasta community as a whole would see a decline following this and would slowly recede back into the walls of the internet. This isn't the end of the story though, not for the creepypasta community and not for the Slender Man. There was a revival that started back in 2020. New stories, new characters, new horror. The community seemed to be coming back to life, with new authors putting out well-written stories and the internet churning out horror concepts not yet fully explored. The narrators and content creators were creating videos with better production value and more emphasis on the community as a whole. It was not only thanks to the writers, but also the rise of new horror mediums like analog horror becoming popular. This is essentially the newest form of creepypasta, the next stage. There's also all the writers on No Sleep adding their horror pieces to the internet collective. Artists like Trevor Henderson who keeps the original Slender Man concept alive. Not only that, but the iceberg video format played a big part in bringing creepypastas back with many creators besides myself getting back in on the nostalgia of it all. There are even Slender Man videos and a new game on the horizon to bring the tall man back into the realm he once owned. Back into the internet collective. Who knows if creepypastas will ever reach that fever pitch they were once at. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. As long as people are creating horror stories, games, and videos to share online, there will always be a new horror rabbit hole to dive down. Slender Man may have been tainted by others, but that doesn't mean that his original concept isn't still worth exploring.